Okay, today we have Caitlin who's going to talk about revenge porn and the role of gender in victim blame attribution. <laughs> to start with, here is my handout. Um, I'll give you guys a minute to scan the QR code. I didn't distribute it to I don't have extra hard copies because my mom had those.
copyright law only protects those whose intimate photos were selfies. It doesn't protect the photos of kind of victims who photographs were taken without the consent. And it's not a conclusive way of seeking justice. It's not always accessible. Additionally, revenge porn website can post, hey, this person has requested this image to be taken down. Let's repost it. So it'll get taken down, and then it'll immediately get reposted on other kind of websites, on the same website, 100% cash. So it's a never ending cycle. Additionally, uh, copy or revenge porn websites can charge the individual, like, hey, give us $350 and we'll take this down, which is extortion. California was the first state to prosecute an extortion case for revenge porn. However, victims can't always go to court and say, hey, they're extorting me. This is getting reposted. They're not always protected. An example of an unsuccessful revenge porn case would be Congresswoman Katie Hill. In 2021, she filed a lawsuit against the Daily Mail and two other journalists after they published compromising images of her that they obtained from an ex lover. The opposing argument said that she failed to meet the requirements of the Mexican law. They also, the journalists asserted that they had a First Amendment right to publish the information about an elected official's behavior that's in history. So in this situation, they were able to successfully argue that the First Amendment right they have extended to her compromising images. It wasn't just a description, hey, she was sexy, she was having an affair, so on and so forth. It was actually protecting the images themselves. So she was penalized for being a public figure. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> yeah, one kind of adult. And I also, this happened in California. So while California was the first state to have successfully prosecuted an extortion case, they also then upheld the Daily Mail and journalists for publishing her images. Again, the prevention law, it just it doesn't always work. One in ten adults have been threatened by an ex partner with posting intimate photos, and of those, 60% of those threats to post the images have been carried out. Two thirds of reported cases were women under the age of 30, many of them perpetrators being an ex partner. I've seen ex husbands, current husbands, fiancés, ex fiancés, um, as perpetrators of images. There are eight female complaints to every one complaint, which demonstrates that this is a female dominated society. Survivors experience trust issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and several other mental health effects. They also experience maladaptive coping mechanisms such as distancing, self-medication, denial, and obsession. This is in line with research of sexual assault victims and what they go through following their traumatization. When a woman is sexually assaulted, society would ask them, well, what were you wearing? But now when a victim is a victim of a revenge porn case, society asks, well, why did you send this so this places the blame on the shoulders of the revenge porn victim and not the, the individual who posted them to begin with, or the revenge porn sites who are actively recruiting people to pose and leave to In 2018, a study found that perpetrator victim relationship links and reasons for relationship victim did not influence the perception of victim blame. However, later that year, a separate study found that when a victim willingly shares an image early on in their relationship, they are blamed more than when they share the image later on in a more established relationship. These findings are in direct contrast of each other, and these studies came out within months of each other, which demonstrates that revenge porn is something that isn't researched very heavily right now, and we need more information on this to find out what is going on. So because these studies in the 2018 Star Morales study, they specifically pointed out in their discussion section that their results contrasted all following the study. Isn't that counterintuitive? I'm sorry for interrupting, but isn't that, isn't that kind of counterintuitive? To blame somebody more, you would think mm -hmm. you're more naive later yeah, on. Yeah, like why did you send this picture so early? There's a higher level of trust. Yeah. Which, going back to this, I think this is where COVID-19 is really going to affect this because when we were in quarantine, we weren't able to go on dates to engage in physical intimacy and the sexting and the behavior became a replacement behavior for that intimacy that we couldn't have. And that goes across new relationships as well as established relationships. Individuals who were in healthcare, they couldn't stay at home. If you worked in a nursing home, you could not be with your family. However, you still want to be intimate with your husband or your spouse or your significant other, um, which is where I think that this is going to really change. Sorry, I was just thinking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> 
my independent variable for the male female participants, and then the hypothetical male female victim to my um, scenario. So, laid out here, a male participant were given a survey of male victim, a male participant was a female victim, female participant was a male victim. And then I compared them left to right. You could be male female good. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Um, the first time I ran my results section, I ran the top to bottom. Uh, I did not find any significant, but it didn't make sense. Uh, my dependent variables uh, were due to combined attribution scores of the male female participants for these different The study limited participants age 8 to 30. I found that the average age for someone engaging in um, texting or sending explicit videos and photographs was 24. And then in the study that found that the majority of victims are under the age of 30, I was going to get 18 to 30. Participants included 74 females and 14 males. Their average ages were roughly the same. Participants were recruited from a small way to university. Their parents and their participation was entirely voluntary. <laughs>
No. It was a mess. Right. Oh my goodness. Okay. Data was analyzed using Microsoft Excel. I ran descriptive statistics and then two simple unusual variance t-tests. There was a max score of 120 and a low score of 0. So starting with the female participant attribution point, there was a comparison of attribution points between female participants who were in the female victim group and male victim group. The female victim group had 50 participants, the male victim group had 10. Um, according to the victim-based attribution questionnaire, the female victim group reported higher victim pain with an average score of 41. The male victim group had an average score of 38. The two sample unequal variance t-tests compared them and indicated no significant difference. I'm sorry, you said the max score was 50? A max score of 120 and lowest score. Max score of 120. Yeah. With a higher score being more blank. Yes. So it's still not a great deal. 41.78 still not a great deal of blank. Yeah. Because she's asking the other people that. Um, no, I'm just saying, I think that would I'm change. I'm not criticizing, I'm just trying to I, process I know, I'm just saying, I think that would change if you were, you know, testing an older population. That would be off the bar. One attribution of the, of the, blaming the victim. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. It was no significant. There was less blame. It was less blame in the male victim than the female. Yeah. Yes, they blamed the female who was in the house. But that's good. For male participation, participant attribution of blame, there was a comparison of the female victim group and the male victim group. The female victim group had 10 participants, the male, the male group had 4 participants. Um, the female victim group reported higher victim blame. I'm sorry, you changed 4 participants? Yes. I will discuss that in a moment. Uh, they had an average score of 49.9, and the male victim group had an average score of 49. Uh, the two sample unequal variance t test indicated no significant difference in the evaluated early The goal of this study was to provide an understanding of how the population is most active in engaging with behavior attributes blame for risk for Many states have implemented laws against the second one, however, there is no legislation at the federal level currently. And there has been no prior research on the role of gender in the attribution of blame for preventing harm. Based on the results, one can conclude that gender does not play a role in the attribution of victim blame. However, it has limitations. The uneven distribution of female participants between the female victim group and male victim group, the female victim group doubled the male victim group. So that was an uneven distribution of female participants there. And then in total, the male gender was underrepresented. With only 14 total male participants, um, 10, I guess, 4. Additionally, the age of participants, I was looking at 18 to 30, but the average scores were 20. So to apply these results to the 18 to 30 age range would kind of be inappropriate. It's a better representation of 18 to 25 or even 18 to 25. Okay, so how was so what about blame for the offender? I'm not, did I miss that? We were not looking at blame for the offender. The study only looked at blame for the victim. However, to look at the scores in reverse, if one has lower blame for the victim, then they have higher blame for the offender. Because I thought, when you give me examples of your, on your, of the questionnaire, yeah. there were items related to the offender as well as the victim. Yes, and those are the ones that were reverse scored. So um, if they say higher victim blame or higher blame on the perpetrator, those scores were reversed. So that way it indicated lower risk. This is, um, while my study was not social or statistically significant, revenge harm is socially significant. This happened, um, this came out uh, March 29th. So in Michigan, there was a high school senior student, Jordan May, who died by suicide. His compromising intent photos were somehow leaked. The perpetrator began extorting him through Instagram um, over pictures that he had taken of himself. He did pay them, however, the perpetrator wanted more money. He was put under extreme pressure. The perpetrator said that he was going to send the pictures to his friends and family. He ended up killing himself within six hours of this whole process starting. 
Hours after his death, a friend who received one of the compromising photos, they contacted his parents, however, he had already died. So this example, this came out March 20th this year of the Michigan. This starts a conversation that one, revenge porn isn't exclusive for adults. It is happening in underage uh, populations. And it happens to males. Males can be victims of this as well as females. The studies are speaking in age range of 18 to 30, so I would not apply these results to the whole 18 to 30 age range with my average 18 to 20 year old. And then with limitations in mind, it's best to conclude that this study provides a stepping stone for research on this. The legal system is not currently set up to effectively help with any kind of offense. So really, until there is federal legislation, revenge porn victims are left relying on laws that were never intended to be used, such as the property law, perhaps the home property law, such types of laws. For further research, I would like to repeat this study with a larger and more easy to use tool. Um, I would like to look at the effect of the COVID-19 on revenge porn. Uh, is it statistically significant? Are prisoners rising at the rate in which they think they are? How does COVID-19 affect individuals applying victim planning to relationship breaking relationship breakdown? And the effectiveness of revenge on state law. What are convicted conviction rates and what are victims, what are they encountering? Are they being successful in pursuing revenge on law? Is it what barriers are Because you have so many ways to go with this. You do it, right? Yes. So you have the age thing, you have the which is so many things you can do. Did you consider looking at well jurors, number one, that's yes. another one too. And then you didn't have like what if the victim and the perpetrator of the same sex. Yes. So then you can look at bias there as well yes. to see if they would be held at a higher level of accountability. Yes. So you would be killing two things with one stone. Number one, what do they feel about with that point? Number two, yes. what about if it's the same sex perpetrator mm -hmm. or victim? Yeah. The argument one. It's all good. I mean, it's so new and it's just it's wide open. You can go with so much stuff. Yes. So how many states did you say had the? the so far, forty plus. Um, forty do. Forty plus. 40. But they're not all the same. They're not. And there's no regulation of them. It does vary state to state. But the three states that I included were vastly different. New Jersey doesn't even include distributing distributing the revenge porn. It's just making it. Um, Was there any uniformity so someone could do a conscious analysis between states? Is there any? I'm surprised there's no, <coughs> excuse me, I'm surprised it's not federal because it's involving yes. the internet. Yes. Yes. So in my lit review, they did talk about how because revenge porn is a female dominated victim crime, a lot of research and progress has been made in gender equality. However, with crimes that have female victims dominating that victim crime, like, they just end up dismissing it or tolerating it, trivializing it. You know, why did she send the picture in the first place? And because that's society's current approach to revenge porn, it is coming across that it's not necessarily an issue for lawmakers at this time. They have other things that they need to prioritize above creating revenge porn law. No, it's it's the it's the complete misogyny of the law. That crimes against women just don't rise to the level of we give a shit about this. Yes. We don't. If that were children, it, this would be a thing. But because it's women, it's not a thing. Yes. Okay. No, and that is what research is saying. I'm hey, sorry, but you know. Yeah. No, it's true. Well, but look, it's just, who, who makes the laws? I right? know. It's, it's, it's like that great picture of a bunch of old white men sitting around discussing women's health care. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then you do have women in Congress, such as Katie Hill, and she ended up getting removed from office over that scandal. So, but there was another case where a male congressman um, out in New England was convicted. Uh, he was found guilty of sending, sending nude images to revenge porn websites. He included names, addresses, social media accounts of his victims, and I don't, I, I don't think he was removed from office. I think 
his um, official statement said that while his behavior was reprehensible, it does not affect his policy making in the in your study, you showed that the women were being more punitive to, other, to the women victims. Yeah. Yes. So I just have, I just have to add, you had such a low response rate yes. from trying to do this virtually. Yes. Right? You couldn't have come to campus for a day? You did. I did come to campus. However, I don't think that helped because the classes that I did go to were predominantly female. I have a question. Yes. So when you compare the, looks like you have a female, a group of female fill out the questionnaire for female victim, and another group of female fill out the questionnaire for male victim, right? Why don't you have a same group of people fill out both form? Oh, um, yeah, I didn't think about it. It wasn't part of my initial design. Yeah. Uh, because in that way, you can increase your sample size. And then, of course, then you would need to do dependent variable, you know, comparison rather than independent. But I just thought when I read your thesis, that's my question. Why don't you have the same sample female answer both sides? Yeah, so maybe that's just my suggestion in the future. Maybe that's another way of comparison. Sun May, are you asking that the same individual would get two? Yeah, so fem for, for example, you go to female group and then you give them, have them finish male, uh, female victim and then male victim. So then you can compare, are they look different? Are they view different because they are different gender of victim? Yeah. 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 Right? It would, it would take some tweaking of that design a little bit. Because it would be, again, it would be within subject design. Because you don't know if reading the first would violate the responses for the second. second. Yeah. You have to counterbalance that. It's a mess. <laughs> yes. That would be a lot to ask someone during COVID <laughs> to do that. Yeah. yeah. The analysis would be brilliant. I mean, I think maybe as this field catches, this, this line of inquiry catches on, I think that we'll see more sophisticated stuff like that. Yes, so when people were taking your survey, they only got like one side. Yes, that was just, oh, yeah. Okay. So when I was sending, um, when I sent out the survey to the different professors, each professor only got one survey to send out. So one professor got the female survey, one survey got the, one professor got the male survey, so on and so forth. So that way their students were only getting one. When I went to the classrooms, I only gave one classroom one or two authors. So I did go to Dr. Law's class, they took the female survey. I went to Victor's class and they took the male survey. Um, and then when I was presenting it, I did tell the participants, if you've already taken the survey, don't take it again. Uh, when I went through the data, I asked for their participant names to make sure that I didn't have any repeats. Yeah. I did have one person take the survey who was over the age of 30 and had to throw their survey out. Um, I didn't, yeah, it said participant age, you must be 18 to 30, and then they said that they were 31, so I threw their survey out, but then I went through all of their names as well to make sure each person only took one survey. I was just thinking of something that, that you just said. Um, so I guess bottom line, what you learned about revenge porn from your study? I learned that it is a female dominated crime. Um, I learned there is so many similarities between revenge porn, sexual assault, harassment, stalking. They experience very similar things, like the obsession, what could I have done differently, the it's like the embarrassment, the the drinking, the coping mechanisms, so on and so forth. I learned that was something. Um, also the creation and really like popularity of revenge porn websites. I have no idea that was true. But this can be, this is like a really big deal because, I mean, okay, this is sex crime and okay, it's victim blaming and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's this hypothesis politically that Trump was so ingratiating to Putin because he had some pictures on him, sexually oriented pictures. Mm -hmm. You're talking about yeah. big political issues, countries being 
the democracy being tested. It really, it. it runs there. Hypothetically. Well, I mean, it's, it's, what's the song, you know, as old as time? I mean, you know, the, the, yeah. the honey trap, they used to call it. Yeah. You know, in the good old days. <laughs> it's been around for a long time. Not like this, though. No. And not, it's. No, but the, it's just, it's so, it's a whole different level when you have what starts out consensual and then somehow gets weaponized against somebody. Well, and the current argument against revenge porn is that when you send out the nude image, you are then giving wide-ranging permission for the individual to send it out to whomever they want. There was a revenge porn operator, I quoted them in my, um, in my paper that said, when you send out a nude image, you are therefore reducing your expectation of privacy. There was a journalist out in the UK that said when you post a new image or when you send a new image, you are doing it with the knowledge that it could end up online one day and then you're being tested for that. So that is the argument against revenge porn saying that it is their fault that they're doing this with total knowledge that it could eventually be posted. The other thing is um, that would have improved your study is to include that section of comments from people. Because that would be really interesting to see mm -hmm. how they conceptualize it in their own yeah. words, you yeah. know, because I'm sure it would be very interesting reading. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, the, what I found was the main reasons um, for legislature not being passed as quickly as victims would like it is the inconsistent conception of privacy in context. First Amendment law or First Amendment rights, which we saw with Katie Hill, in that argument, they were able to extend their First Amendment right to revenge porn in the images that the journalist posted of her, um, as well as the fact that it mostly females and it's just not an issue for policymakers at this time to protect women. I think you did an excellent job. Point he did do a study on prison pencil. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> I need to check up on my prison pencil. He should be getting out here soon. Oh my god. I, yeah, he got arrested like what, 2016? <laughs> Till 2030. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Check out Greg. It was very well done. Yeah. yeah. Excellent.